Well, here this morning on Epiphany Sunday, we have a wonderful special treat. My wife, uh, Pastor Emma Williams, is going to be sharing the Word of God with us here today uh, for many reasons, but especially because this Sunday of Epiphany and the season we are entering into, she has a special connection to that you're going to learn a lot about here this morning. So I'm very excited that she is here with us today to bring the Word of God. I want to encourage you to pull out your GPS, your guide for prayer and study. This is a tool we use each week um, during the message and throughout the week to stay engaged together as a church family through word and prayer. On the front, you're going to find information about today's message and a place to take notes because we believe when we open the word of God each Sunday, God speaks to us. So we encourage you to write down one important thing that God is saying to you here today. On the back, you're going to find scripture readings from the Old and New Testaments that all relate back to today's message and a way to be in prayer together as a church family for each day. This is a great thing to use with your kids and family. It's quick and easy. We also post these on our Facebook page every morning at 6 a.m. It's a great way to start your day off with God. So here this morning to give us um, an introduction into the Epiphany season and to hear that scriptural story, Chris Krishna is going to come read our passage. Today's scripture is from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all, all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where is the Messiah, where the Messiah was to be born? They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, by no means least among rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler." who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them, went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over, over the place that the child was. When they saw that star, the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. I, um, like Alex said, Epiphany is a special season for me, and um, so I'm excited to be here to talk with you all about it. But before, will you please join me in prayer? Loving and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you. May you speak to us here today in this room. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Um, okay, that's going to be how it's going to be. Um, so I am so happy to be at Crossway. This is Alex and um, my second Christmas season at Crossway. And there are a lot of reasons that I'm happy to be here, but... One of the reasons is that the church we were at before Crossway, everyone was from Texas. And not only Texas, but everyone was from the city. Everyone was from like a couple miles from where the church was. Everyone was from Texas. And um, I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I am not from Texas. I, like many of you, uh, am a transplant. And it's great to come to church with people that are from all over, from California and Florida and Indiana and Tennessee and Kansas and even the UK, um, because unless you went through some really formative years in Texas, you lack some sort of internal programming that makes it possible to appreciate Texas in the way that a Texan does. 
Like, I'm pretty sure they play deep in the heart of Texas on, like, a special baby frequency in the neonatal units in hospitals because people that aren't from Texas just can't, just can't quite get there in their love of Texas. But I think it's great because people from Texas love Texas. They think everything is the best. And even when they have, like, individual complaints, still they will go to their grave saying, Texas is God's country. Texas is the best. Um, and I'm from Louisiana, and we like our state. We like our state fine, Uh, but no one is out there saying, like, Louisiana has the best infrastructure in the whole nation, right? No one's out there saying that, all right? And there's no movement for Louisiana to secede from the United States. We know we wouldn't make it. Like, we, we know that. So needless to say, I don't quite understand just that blind adoration of Texas, but in general, also, I'm just a little more measured with my home state loyalty. But... There are two exceptions to this, Uh, and I honestly think that Louisiana just dominates at these two things, all right? So the first is food, and my dad is a chef, so I am a little biased, but I love the flavors of Creole and Cajun food from South Louisiana and sort of the home cooking from, like, middle and north Louisiana that I grew up with my grandmother making. So I stand very firmly in the Louisiana food camp, and if you want to fight with me about, like, Texas barbecue or whatever, that's fine. Like, we can have that argument later, but just know that, like, I am very loyal to the Louisiana food superiority situation. So, the second thing that I am absolutely convinced of is that Louisiana knows how to throw a party. And in general, yes, because of the food, right? The food makes a really good party. But what I'm talking about right now, and specifically, is Mardi Gras. All right, laissez le bon temps rouler, right? Let the good times roll. Mardi Gras now is pretty ubiquitous. People have heard of Mardi Gras. But when I was growing up, uh, it wasn't really the same way. And I remember talking to my cousins in Texas who had never heard of Mardi Gras, never been to Mardi Gras, and I was just aghast because it's such an integral part of, it was such an integral part of my year. And also it was just really, really fun, and I was sad that they weren't doing that. Um, So Mardi Gras has really shaped the way sort of I move about the world. Um, One sort of funny thing is that uh, I didn't know if or where you would buy plastic drinking cups because all of the cups we had in our house were glass cups that you would use when people came over and then plastic Mardi Gras cups that they like threw off of a float. So much so that when I got my first apartment, I was like, I really need Mardi Gras to come around because I don't have any cups. And we just got, like, these three stacks of cups that were that tall. We got too many. We overestimated, but we were too excited. Um, So that was one way that Mardi Gras kind of influenced me. And also, I remember my first time going to a non-Mardi Gras parade. I was um, probably, like, late elementary school, early middle school, and we went to visit my aunt who lived in a small town in Illinois. And the town had a festival, and part of the festival was a parade. And so we got up early, we got our spot at the parade, and the parade starts passing by, and no one is throwing me anything. I'm receiving nothing from this parade. And so my mom had to explain to me, you know, not every parade do you stand there and people throw you beads and cups and doubloons and, like, hot dogs and moon pies or whatever. Like, that's not what every parade is. Most parades you just stand there. And I was like, wait, so we just, we're just going to stand here and, like, the people are going to drive by. So why? I don't, what, why? Why are we doing this? So I still don't really, I'm not a good parade goer unless it's a Mardi Gras parade because I'm like, I don't know, it's kind of cold. you got to stand for a long time, and I'm not getting anything. Like, I want a bunch of plastic beads that then I'm like, what am I going to do with all these? But in the moment, it's really exciting. So <laughs> Mardi Gras is this really fun time, um, this huge celebration. It's really ratcheted up what I think of when I think of celebrating. And if you don't know the details, Mardi Gras is a French, it's French for Fat Tuesday, and it's the day before Ash Wednesday. And it's this huge celebration, and frankly, kind of a uh, gluttonous celebration before the fasting and self-denial of Lent started. And it has these Catholic roots. Um, Mardi Gras is a day, but it's actually the pinnacle of a whole season of celebration called Carnival Season, and it begins with Epiphany, which is today. Uh, So at any given point between today and March 5th, 
uh, which is Mardi Gras, there will be king cakes in break rooms and elementary school classrooms and kitchen counters all across the state of Louisiana because this whole season is about celebrating. And even though Mardi Gras has long lost its any sort of religious roots or connotations, this should be a time of celebration in the church because today is Epiphany. It's a day that celebrates the wise men's arrival to the home of the baby Jesus. And it's a time when we should be in awe of the gift that we have received and given rejoicing in the presence of God. Um, Now, the wise men have some misconceptions that come with them, and a lot of this has to do with when we set up a manger scene or we do a nativity play. Um, And so generally, just like the one we did here at Crossway, we have the shepherds and the angels and the wise men and the star, and they all come together, and they all present this beautiful one single tableau. And it's great, and there are parts for everyone. And we're telling just sort of this whole meta story. But actually, those stories of the shepherds and the stories of the wise men don't even occur in the same gospel. The story of the shepherds is in the gospel of Luke, and the story of the wise men is in the gospel of Matthew. And they didn't necessarily happen at the same time. They didn't overlap. We don't have a specific timeline for the wise men's journey and arrival at Bethlehem. But the scripture says that after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem. So uh, the night that Jesus was born, they started their journey. So they probably didn't show up at the manger. We're all going to hope that Jesus was not still living in a manger after this long journey to Bethlehem. They were probably showing up to a new family in Bethlehem, not a manger. And they didn't quite follow the star directly to Bethlehem. As we heard, the passage in Matthew tells us that wise men followed the star to Jerusalem, where King Herod told them that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, or the Messiah was born in Bethlehem. And King Herod learned that from a group of priests and scribes who consulted the, what we would consider the Old Testament, and consulted the prophets for prophecy of where the Messiah would be born. And even calling wise men wise men doesn't really tell us who they are. Sometimes we call them kings, or we think of them as royalty. So what they probably were were astrologers. They were probably people that followed the stars, and so it made sense that they were setting out on this long journey to follow an extraordinary event in the heavens. And so when we think about the wise men, it's not completely a forget everything you know about the wise men, but it's pretty close because when we think of the wise men just as these three figurines that sit in our creche next to the camels, we don't give them the story of depth and significance that they deserve. And one of the largest parts of the wise men's stories that gets kind of edited out when we lump it in with the whole Christmas story is kind of the most uh, suspenseful part, and it's that uh, the presence of King Herod in this story. And we've talked about this with the kids' way because it's super exciting, um, and it's something that Uh, kids are very interested in because it's like an action movie, kind of. Um, So King Herod was the client king of Judea. And that basically means um, at that time, the Roman Empire was the Roman Empire, but they let King Herod be the king of Judea while being subordinate to him in every way. So he had some power, but still he was under the authority of Rome. And so when the astrologers came from a foreign land following a star that they said told them that the birth of the king of the Jews had happened and wanting to honor this child, wanting to say this is the king of the Jews, Herod would have been understandably a little nervous because Herod was the king of the Jews. That was his title by all intents and purposes. And losing that title meant losing his power and the power of everyone who surrounded him. So that's why when the scripture says all of Jerusalem was frightened, it wasn't all of Jerusalem. It was those people in power, the religious people that held power. So um, that's why they came to Jerusalem, because that was the seat of power, and that's where a king would be born, right? In Jerusalem. Um, And so Herod, in an effort to locate this king, called together people who knew scripture well. So those were the priests and the scribes. And they asked, and he asked, where would the birthplace of the Messiah be, as foretold by the prophets, and they told him Bethlehem. And so Herod calls for the wise men in secret and sends them out on a seemingly innocuous mission. Go find this baby king so that I might pay him homage. 
Now, of course, that's not what Herod wanted to do. He did not want to pay the baby homage. He sent them in to find the baby king so he could curtail that baby's reign of power. And his plans aren't revealed explicitly in the scripture, but a few verses later, when Herod realizes the wise men aren't going to come back and tell them where the baby is, he is infuriated, and the incident that follows is known as the Massacre of the Innocents. So we can assume that Herod was not wanting to find the baby, take him under his wing, and teach him how to be a great ruler. Herod had some bad plans, and it's easy to paint Herod with a really broad, really evil brush, because he honestly was a bad dude. And in the Bible, he was described as a bad dude, and then outside of the Bible, in the definitive account of Jewish history, which was written by a man named Josephus, he was a bad guy. He abused his power. But since we revisit Epiphany every year, and since Herod and his ruling class are part of this Epiphany story, it's important to try and examine what God could be telling us through this part of the story every year. What is God telling you through this story of Herod? I know that I hear a call to accountability because I don't like to admit it, um, but I like to be the authority on things. I like to be good at what I do. I like for people to come to me when they want to know something, and I don't like to avail myself to the authority of others very much. So much so that I refuse to go bowling because I'm not good at bowling, I can't have fun, even though, like, I can't just have fun, even though I'm bad at it. And I don't want someone to teach me how to bowl in front of other people, or maybe ever. So I'm a blast. Like, invite me to your next party. Um, but so I, I'm not great with being vulnerable about my weaknesses. I like being right. I like being the authority. And I hear that fear in Herod about losing his power. The presence of the Messiah should have been good news for all Jewish people, They were all expecting it in different ways and to different levels, but this was good news for the Jewish people, and it should have been good news for Herod and the priest and the scribes because they were certainly Jewish people. They would have been the most holy of all holies. They were super religious, and they had already, though, made their own good news. They didn't need a Messiah because the good news that they had made for themselves felt pretty comfortable. They didn't think they needed any better news. But making your own good news leaves you blind and deaf to the reality that God sets before us a vision for our lives and the way that we can live into the kingdom of God that is beyond what we can plan and implement. And it involves more listening and humbling ourselves than preserving our own power and autonomy. And so it's not the super religious characters that we're supposed to follow, as often is in the Gospels. They often point us to an unexpected hero And that's who the wise men are in this story. And the next part is the part of the story that we know really well is when the wise men arrive at the home of Jesus. Once again, probably not the manger, hopefully something more structurally sound. So they arrive at the home of Jesus, and the star stops over it, and they go in, and they were overwhelmed with joy. Remember, these were not Jewish people, so they were not awaiting the coming Messiah. They were Gentiles. Um, They were probably practitioners of an ancient monotheistic religion called Zoroastrianism. And yet, when they saw this baby, they knelt down before him. They gave him gifts of great value and great significance. And after being warned in a dream of Herod's ill intentions, they sacrificed their safety to go back another way. These are people who didn't have a consistent context of who Jesus would be, of who the Messiah was. But in his presence, they were compelled to worship and adore him. And after this experience, they found another way home. And this simple verse at the very end of Matthew was the thing that caught my attention when I reread the Epiphany story this year. They left for their own country by another road. I started thinking about this other road that the wise men took on the way home and thinking maybe it wasn't just another route. It wasn't just another set of geographic locations. I mean, it was definitely another road, but it didn't just not take them through Jerusalem. It would have been a completely different trip. The journey to Jerusalem would have been filled with a lot of questions and anticipation and maybe doubt. It would have been filled with waiting and hope and wondering And if this sounds familiar, it did for me too, because it sounds like our journey through Advent. 
where we wait with hope and anticipation and wonder. Maybe we doubt, too. Certainly, we ask questions. What does it mean that God came to earth as a baby? I mean, really, what does it mean to you that God came to earth as a baby? And what does it matter? And what are we celebrating? This is our journey to the baby. But once we are there, what happens? What happened to the wise men? They were overcome with joy, and they fell down to pay homage. Were all their questions answered? Did they fact-check prophets to ensure that the messiahship was valid? Did they write a report of validity of their findings? No, they saw the baby king, and they knew. They knew that this child was different and more than special and holy and awe-inspiring. And that's what I feel at Christmas. I look back on our candlelight service that we had at Crossway. And as a child brought the light in and then shared the light with the whole congregation, and we sang Silent Night, a cappella, all of our voices lifted up together, that quiet tradition without reason or logic, that brought me assurance of faith. That gives me a little taste of what the wise men maybe felt adoration and assurance and love and comfort and something that's bigger than ourselves, that was happening, and that was happening for us. And then when they left, what happened? I don't know if it was because I was thinking about Mardi Gras and the king cake that I wasn't going to eat because I live in Texas now, but I thought, man, that other road, that must have been some parade because the road wasn't filled with waiting anymore. It was filled with rejoicing. It must have been. And so I already imagine the wise men sort of in like a la- an elaborate costume, not unlike Mardi Gras royalty, which like if that's historically accurate or not, it's not, I'm sure. Um, so that's why I already kind of imagine them in these sort of elaborate uh, attire. And then I wonder that they weren't so changed by their encounter with Jesus that they shared their joy with everyone that they met. Not unlike the float riders at Mardi Gras who gleefully tossed their throws to people who lined the streets. That's what caught my attention. And though it is 100% anachronistic, they found another way home, and it could have been this great parade. These men met God who came to earth, and there's time to change and grow, but there's also, it's time right now to celebrate. And the church doesn't do celebration well because we feel like we always have to be sorry for something. Our posture is always that of repentance. We always have to feel bad for our shortcomings. One of my professors in seminary used to joke with us that when we went to chapel and had communion, everyone would approach the altar looking like they were about to be scolded by their principal. And her point was that communion is holy, yes, and special and reverent, and it acknowledges a time of great anxiety, but we live past that anxiety. We live with the risen Christ, and it's it's the celebration of Holy Communion. That's what we call it, and we should be eager and anxious to take part of it. We shouldn't have to whisper, the body of Christ broken for you. It should be something that we're excited about, but we're taught as Christians that we have to constantly be repenting for our sinfulness, and that's a good practice. It reminds us that we have to rely on God to walk in the way that leads to life. But being a Christian should fill us with joy. We have a time to take somber reflection on ways that we have fallen short and ways that we might journey more toward God. And that's the season of Lent, and that's coming up. Don't worry. We'll start that on March 6th with Ash Wednesday. But between now, Epiphany, and then, what if we take another road? What if we allow ourselves to be overwhelmed with the joy of the gift of Christ? A gift that teaches us the fullness of God's love for us, God's unrelenting love for everyone in this room. How might that fortify us in this year, in 2019? Unrelenting joy. Maybe it's spontaneity for you. Maybe it's saying yes to ice cream with your kids which, yes, I am here to wreck your New Year's resolutions. Um, Or maybe it's taking the time to enjoy the company of your spouse instead of watching two different Netflix shows on two different Apple devices. You know I'm guilty of that sometimes. Um, Maybe it's embracing the joy of toddler play rather than watching the clock for nap time. 
Maybe it's taking a mental health day that you already need this year and seeing an early bird movie or pushing purchase on those tickets to see some friends that are far away. Something that brings joy to your life. Whatever it looks like for you, I challenge you to find that joy in this season, in this epiphany season, because Christ's presence should fill us with joy. And if we, rele- if we realize the gift of the baby born in Bethlehem, we'll find that joy in everything that we do. Find a little Mardi Gras for yourself this epiphany season and let the God who continually transforms our life show you that celebration is alive in all of creation. Let us pray. Holy and amazing God, we thank you for coming to this earth and becoming human. God, help us experience joy this season. Help us find those places where your joy bursts through our day-to-day lives and that you allow us to come into the presence of your love. God, there are things that we can be better at. There are things that we're, are taking us away from you. But in this season, we pray to find that joy and love and hope and happiness and acceptance in everything so that we see your face in every part of creation. And as we pray for that joy, we also pray in the way that your son taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.